Uh, I'm responsible to, for introducing uh, Professor Tanjay Seth. He completed his education in Sydney and Canberra, and then after, uh, Sanjay held positions at City University and La Trobe University, Melbourne, as well as fellowship at Tokyo University and also in Kyoto University recently. He moved to Goldsmith University of London in 2007 uh, to take up the chair in politics. There he is the direct director of the Center of Postcolonial Studies. Uh, Sanjay has, has published in the fields of modern Indian history, political and social the theory, post-colonial theory, and international relations. He's particularly interested in how modern European ideologies and modern Western knowledge, more generally, travel to the non-Western world and what effects this had both on the non-Western world and on modern Western knowledge. His current work is focused on whether the presumption, presupposition, 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 presumption, presumption, yes, yes. presumptions that inform our modern knowledge are universal, meaning adequate to all times and places, as is usually supposed, or whether they are in fact parochial presumptions that are specific modern and western, but that illegitimately pass themselves off as universal. He often uses uh, his Indian archive to raise and pursue these broad social, cultural, and epistemological questions. He has edited and published uh, books and articles on these complex fields, such as Postcolonial Theory and International Relations, a Critical Introduction, published by Rutledge in 2012, Subject Lessons, The Western Education of Colonial India, published by Duke University Press in 2007, Marxist Theory and Nationalist Politics, The Case of Colonial India, by Sage Publications in 1995. He also published some articles like uh, Nationalism, Modernity and the Women Question in India and China uh, in the Journal of Asian Studies in 2013. Razão Raciocínio, Clio Shiva, in História da Historiografia, uh, which was first published as Reason or Reasoning, Clio or Shiva, that was published in Social Text in 2004. Um, Contrasting Modernities, India and China, also in the Journal of Asian Studies. Uh, historiography and Non-Western Past, that appeared in Istorhein, uh, Greek uh, uh, journal, in 2010. And Which Past? Whose Transcendental Presuppositions in Postcolonial Theory in 2008? Uh, please. Uh, Sanjay, if I may call you by your first name. Um, it's a pl It's a, is this working? Yep. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here, and um, I thank Marcelo for his very generous introduction, and more generally, I'd like to thank Berber and Marcelo for the opportunity to speak, and not only them, but all the other people um, who have put so much time, effort, and energy into organized time, effort, and intellectual and logistical energy into organizing a conference on the scale of which we're all the collective beneficiaries. So thank you very much. Um, without further ado, from the moment the British became territorial rulers of Bengal, down to the moment that they were forced to relinquish their Indian possessions, they wrote histories of India beginning with Alexander Dow's The History of Hindustan in the latter 18th century, going on to James Mill's The History of British India, and many, many others too numerous to cite. It was from such works and from the teaching of history in the schools and colleges that the British established that in Ranajit Guha's words, the Bengali intellectual learned to rethink his own past according to a post-enlightenment rationalist view of history. British, author, British authored histories of India were very soon followed by Indian ones. At first, such histories tended to accept the narrative of Britain's improving mission in India. But soon, historiography became the site of contestation, as nationalists sought to write histories that would do justice to the past of their peoples. Neither of these variants, however, whether following the British or contesting their accounts, neither of them were traditional, that is to say, Puranic histories of colonialism, but were rather histories in the rationalist post-enlightenment mode 
introduced by the British. Modern historiography was increasingly thought of by elite Indians to be the right way of representing the past because it was seen to be rational, secular, and based upon evidence, by contrast with, the, with their earlier Puranic traditions, which consisted in Thomas Babington Macaulay's dismissive words of history abounding with kings 30 feet high and reigns 30,000 years long. The assumption that was being accepted here was that history writing is about something called the past, a more or less unproblematic entity that simply exists in the form of traces it has left behind, which rational evidence-based history reconstructs and then represents. But for some time now, as we all know, this view has been under challenge. Figures as diverse as Louis Althusser, Michael Oakeshott, and Paul Vane have argued that the past is not something that history writing simply finds and then represents, but something that first has to be constituted as an object. In the words of Claude Levi-Strauss, history does not escape the common obligation of all knowledge to employ a code to analyze its object. Or as Constantine Fasalt has put it more recently, history is the product of a technology. It does not simply lie around like stones or apples ready to be picked up by anyone who pleases. It must first be produced. Now, what I want to draw attention to here are not the details of the arguments of an Oakeshott, Louis Strauss, Vane, Fasolt, and many others, but rather the general point that I take them to be making in their different ways. That history as discipline does not simply find and apply itself to the past, but that it constitutes the object that it then investigates and represents. History is a code, Levi Strauss's word, a technology, Fasolt's word, or a genre, Paul Vane's word one which rests upon certain presuppositions and operations that constitute an object that is available and amenable to historical investigation. But these presuppositions are seldom acknowledged, let alone explicated and subjected to criticism. And if this is so, a number of questions present themselves, questions that would not and did not appear on the horizon as long as history writing was conceived as the more or less unproblematic representation of the past through the documents and the sources that it bequeathed to us. We are, firstly, in a position to ask what the presuppositions of history writing are. That is to say, to inquire into the elements of the code. Second, if history is a code, if it's not simply the accurate representation of the past, but a particular way of constituting it, then we can also ask, why this code? What is it that it does? What is it for? In asking this question, we are now assuming that while a sense of historicity might be a human universal, history writing, as we moderns in the West have understood and practiced it, is not. It is not the right way finally discovered of presenting the past, but rather one way. And finally, we can ask if this code produced in the West is adequate to non-Western pasts. And these are the questions that my paper will be addressed to. Now, as we all know, and as has been quoted ad infinitum, Leopold von Ranke famously wrote, history has had assigned to it the task of judging the past, of instructing the present for the benefit of ages to come. The present study, his study, does not assume such high office. It wants to show only what really happened. Now, the claim to objectivity that is seen to be implicit in this formulation has, of course, been much commented upon and contested since. But what is surely equally striking about this passage, and has not been commented upon as much, is the explicit distinction it draws between judging and instructing on the one hand and knowing and truthfully representing on the other. History is being conceived by Ranke and others now as a relation to the past that is solely cognitive. The measure of good history is not its capacity to instruct, please, or delight, but to accurately represent. History has become a discourse of truth, and as such it requires not facility in rhetoric or in moral or theological reasoning, but rather a method that was conducive to the discovery and representation of the truth about the past. History writing was now being conceived as a cognitive enterprise, and it was so conceived because the past was seen as dead, something that could only be known, not something that could instruct or delight. Conversely, it was because the past was seen as dead that the study of it could be, essentially, a cognitive matter. 
Cognition is the only thing at issue for that which does not belong to our present. Gab Gabrielle Spiegel elaborates the point I'm making by means of a contrast. She writes, historians must draw a line between what is dead and what is not, and therefore they posit death as a total social fact in contrast to tradition, which figures a lived body of traditional knowledge borne by living societies. The chief aim of modern historiography, she writes, has become that of representing, rather than, as formerly, resurrecting the past. Now, at a time when such ways of relating to the past were still alive and constituted an alternative to modern historiography, they were usually subject to scorn and denunciation for their anachronisms, for presuming that a dead past could be resurrected, and so on. It's only in recent decades, when history has become the dominant form of relating to the past in many parts of the world, that a space seems to have opened for at least some historians to recognize that these other ways of relating to the past were not failed versions of our mode of historicity, but alternative modes of historicity, and even to impose elegies to their decline. In his important book, Zakor, Jewish History and Jewish Memory, Yosef Yerushalmi writes that the Jews are, the peop are a people for whom memory of the past was a central aspect of their collective experience and identity. Zakor is the injunction, remember, remember. But the, <coughs> the rabbinic literature, <coughs> which was one of the primary means of remembering and transmitting the past, was not modern historiography, of course. The Talmud or the Midrash do not record significant events. They omit what we would consider significant events. They often rely on unreliable sources. They often ignore our conception of time by placing all the ages in an ever-fluid dialogue with one another, are often unaware of or freely practice anachronism, and they are drastically selective in winnowing out what is remembering, remembered and repressed at will. This was, in short, of remembering and a way of remembering and relating to the past that sought, in Yerushalmi's words, not the historicity of the past, not its deadness, but its eternal contemporaneity. Works by Yerushalmi, Pierre Nora, and others are reminders by historians, modern historians, that there have been many modes by which humans have related to their past for most of human history. Such modes vary greatly from one another, but they have in common, at least when contrasted with modern historiography, that they are highly selective in what is preserved and transmitted, need not be secular, and are often untroubled by anachronism. These commonalities derive from and attest to the fact that the past that they attend to, these modes of historicity, the past that they attend to is not seen to be dead, but is in a very real sense a part of the present and the future. To quote Spiegel's words again, these are modes of resurrecting the past. What is novel and distinctive about the code of modern historiography is that a central feature of it is that the past cannot be resurrected, only represented. Now, there are, of course, practices of modern historiography that are partial exceptions to this because they treat their object as at once belonging to the past and in that sense being dead, and yet also as belonging to the present and in that sense as undead. Histories of beauty and truth are amongst these specialized fields, and we need to attend to these. We need to attend to them because we need to attend to any exceptions to a claim, to the claim that I'm making, but we also need to attend to them because at the end of my paper, I will be returning to this point um, about these modes of history. The history of art, music, and science all have in common that the object practice that they present the history of is at once of the past and yet not fully so. In the case of art history and music history, this is because the artwork and the work of music are thought to be autonomous. They do not refer to something outside of themselves and thus cannot be treated only as a sign or trace of something else. Though produced in the past, they are a living part of the present. Since, therefore, any systematic history of music or art has to both historicize while recognizing that its object is in some sense resistant to historicization or beyond history, a history of objects and practices that belong to the aesthetic has proved a perilous enterprise defined by the never-ending struggle to steer between Scylla and Charybdis. As Lydia Gore describes this struggle, 
One of the basic problems of music history is how to reconcile the desire to treat musical works as purely musical entities with value and significance on their own, on the one hand, with the desire, on the other, to acknowledge that such works are tainted, influenced, and shaped by their historical contexts. The opposition, she goes on to write, has been formulated in many ways, most commonly as the aesthetic versus the historical, or as the musical versus the extra-musical. And the opposition or dilemma has been very similar in the history of art. Michael Podro observes, either the context-bound quality or the irreducibility of art may be elevated at the expense of the other. If a writer diminishes the sense of context in his concern for the irreducibility or autonomy of art, he moves towards formalism. If he diminishes the sense of irreducibility in order to keep a firm hand on extra artistic facts, he runs the risk of treating art as if it were the trace or symptom of these other facts. The history of science is in important ways different from the history of music and art, for it is a history of truth. And truth is usually assumed to always be there, awaiting discovery, whereas, of course, art and music we think of as being created. Indeed, why truthful beliefs about the natural world came to be embraced is often thought to need no explanation, for as David Bloor observes, in the history of science, quote, logic, rationality, and truth appear to be their own explanation. You don't have to explain truth historically, you only have to explain error. Given this, the very idea of a history of science, as one commentator notes, seems like an oxymoron, like phrases like jumbo shrimp or deafening silence. But while truthful beliefs about the natural world, about the natural world came to be embraced, sorry, while why truthful beliefs about the natural world came to be embraced needed no explanation, when and how these came to be embraced and with what consequences could form the subject matter of a historical narrative, and many histories of science were consequently tales of discovery, of the historical circumstances in which eternal ahistorical truths were discovered, of the heroes who discovered them, and of the ways in which the human place in the cosmos changed as we discovered more about it. Here too, as in art and music history, navigating the boundary between historicity and the extra-historical while doing justice to both proved enormously difficult and gave rise to debates and disputes such as those in the history of science between internalists and externalists. Now, the fact that there are histories which are premised on the need to be cognizant and attentive to the fact that their object, the artwork or science, is historical and yet not so, that it is of the past and yet also of the present, renders them different from the remainder of history, unmarked or general history, history to court, as it were, which deals with all of that which belongs wholly to the past, which can be historicized without remainder, that which is well and truly dead. But in recent decades, these specialized areas of history have, be have become the sites of vibrant debates and disputes, and one of the effects of these has been that the combination of historicity and extra-historicity that licenses their distinctiveness as fields of history has become problematized and harder to sustain. Even art, music, and truth, it seems, are in danger of becoming wholly past and becoming indistinguishable from general history. There have been a number of reasons for this development, but one of them is that the very process of historicization has revealed the degree to which the aesthetic premises that might sustain the writing of music or art history are themselves historical. It has been argued, for instance, that the idea of the autonomy of music, the idea of music as a work existing in and for itself, rather than subordinate to religious, pedagogical, or other concerns, is in fact a late 18th century development, which went hand in hand with other changes, the elevation of the composer to a new dignity, um, the score as the, 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 the work itself, and so on and so forth. This became a regulative ideal which then governed the production of West musical works within the Western classical tradition. With it went the emancipation of the composer from patrons, the audience quietly listening in the concert hall rather than you know, eating peanuts and talking to each other as the performance was going on. In the repertoire of classical music, um, which then developed, this was retrospectively and anachronistically projected backwards onto music which had not been produced under circumstances where the work concept 
was dominant. And this same anachronism has underpinned music history, which has treated music from before the 18th century as if these two were works which can and should be treated as autonomous aesthetic objects. And something very similar has occurred in art history. Our growing knowledge that for much of Western history, art objects were not regarded as autonomous, but variously as bearers of religious messages, items of prestige, and so on and so forth, that their producers were not accorded the exalted status that some artists came to be subsequently, but were often on a par with craftsmen and were often organized in guilds. All these and other things have served to make clear that the autonomy of the artwork is not a historical fact, an eternal historical fact, but a relatively recent fact. We are left then, to put it schematically, with two possibilities. Either art and music are in fact autonomous and always have been so, but this was not fully recognized or discovered until the 18th and 19th century. Now, this is the account of modern knowledge in which there are certain things that have always been true, but we moderns are the ones who were in the privileged position to finally be able to discover things that were true even before they were discovered, but once discovered could finally come out into their app. This is the account and justification of modern knowledge that the book from which this paper is drawn seeks to challenge. It is one of the key presumptions of our modern Western knowledge that it discovered what had been true all along. For instance, that gods are to be explained in terms of men and not men in terms of gods that nature is disenchanted, and so on and so forth. These had always been true, but only became visible with the modern. As it is usually part of this account that the sphere of inward subjectivity comes to be properly recognized with modernity. There was always a sphere of inward subjectivity, but it is not until the modern period that it is fully recognized and that art and music and so on can now be detached from their exigenous concerns with religion, politics, and so on and so forth. So either that, either this was always true, but only came into its own in the last two or three centuries, or the autonomous artwork is not a fact of the world discovered, but something invented, itself a historical artifact. Either the line from Baumgarten through Kant to Hegel was the discovery of an aesthetic domain always there, but hitherto mingled and unfortunately subordinated to exiguous concerns, or the existence of an aesthetic domain and the implications drawn from this is itself a historical creation and invention. If the latter, and I am emphatically opting for the latter, if the latter, then we can treat the art and the music work as autonomous or semi-autonomous, as belonging to the past and yet not fully doing so, only for that period in the history of the West when it came to be produced and widely regarded as such, and not for places and times when it did not have this status. Some art and music historians have implicitly and in some cases explicitly drawn precisely this conclusion. And as they do so, art and music history ceases to be sharply distinguished from history to core. And for somewhat different reasons, this has occurred with a vengeance in the history of science. Historicizing science, scholars in the field are increasingly pointed out, has had the unexpected effect that the historicization of the category has ended up fragmenting the entity in question itself. So rather than writing a history of science, which sort of assumes that there's something called science, going back to Aristotle, etc., even though, and the historicization of it is recognizing the ways in which it keeps changing, the history of science has increasingly become the story of the emergence of the category science quite late in the day, and a category which cannot be unanachronistically applied to earlier times and places. Increasingly, the idea of science and even the idea of nature appears not as the premise, but rather as the outcome of the history which is being plumbed by historians of science. And as it does so, history of science ceases to be different in any fundamental way from history to court. Now, I'm not suggesting that the sub-disciplines of music, art, and science history are about to disappear, and of course the trend I'm pointing to is contested. But there are plentiful signs that historicizing has a corrosive effect, and such that even that which was thought to escape death, and which therefore required different modes of history writing, is becoming part of history to court. 
Okay, so far I've been suggesting that one very important element of the code of history is that the past is dead. What are some of the others? Well, we can ask, what is history of? What is, it, what is its subject? The answer is so self-evident. History is the history of man, of humanity, that the question seems redundant. What else could history be the history of? But the ways in which people have remembered their past have not always been ones in which humanity is the sole subject. Creation stories, myths, epics, and legends typically, for instance, involve gods and spirits. Also, what we call nature and think of as disenchanted, something of which you cannot write a history that belongs to geologists and others, but for others, nature not being disenchanted, has thrumming with meanings and purposes, is also takes a place in their accounts of the past. So to equate the past with the human past is a presupposition or a decision, part of the code of history, not a self-evident fact. Following both its proponents and some of its critics, we could, in shorthand form, call this element of the code of history anthropology in the philosophical rather than the, the disciplinary sense. This anthropology is almost always also a humanism, meaning not only that the subject of history is man and only man, but also that this subject is a subject, that is to say, a meaning and purpose endowing being who objectifies himself or herself in the world. And this has been the charter of the modern humanities and most of the social sciences. That for the discipline of history, in fact, the past simply is the thoughts and doings of men and women of the past the ways in which they endowed their world with meaning and significance, represented to the degree that the sources, seen as the objectifications of their thoughts, desires, wills, and actions, allow us to do so. So, another element of the code of history. History writing is humanist, anthropological in its presumptions, and often hermeneutical in its methods. But as we all know, this is not the only presumption underlying history writing. Modern knowledge divided the world into nature and the human, and with regard to the latter, the human, posited both freedom and constraint. Man as the self-determining maker of meanings and history, and yet also as constrained and shaped, with the most potent form of this constraint being represented by the concept category of society. The same dualism or tension runs through most of the human sciences to different degrees and in different ways. In the case of history, if the humanist anthropological presumption runs through history, as both the champions and the critics of it aver, then so too does the presumption that the actions and meanings of men and women are shaped or determined, often in ways unbeknownst to them, behind their backs. Indeed, that their self-perceptions may even be systematically distorted because society or consciousness may be opaque to itself. Thus, recreating the meanings which men and women gave their world may be irrelevant to recreating the realities of that world, or at least maybe the first rather than the last word in historical explanation. The most commonly invoked such constraint is, as I mentioned, society. And this presumption is also one of the enabling presumptions of history writing. Now, my point here is that both these elements, humanism, anthropology, and the emphasis on the constraints on human self-invention and meaning production are part of the code of history. To be sure, they do not mesh seamlessly. Indeed, there's a tension between them. But most history writing includes elements of both, or at least acknowledges that both are a necessary part of what it means to write history. In any given historical work, the accent may fall more on one than on the other, but both are implicitly or explicitly present, and the ideal work of history is often thought to be that which gives the impression of seamlessly combining both. And if that's true at the level of the individual work, the discipline as a whole has often tended to be oscillate between these two things that I'm saying are equally part of the code of history. So on the one hand, think of economic history or social history, which emphasizes the constraints, and then think of you know, the, 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 the linguistic turn, cultural history, et cetera, which is more, con without saying there aren't constraints, is more concerned with meaning production, with recreating the meaning meanings that things had to the participants in that historical period. So, thus far I've been suggesting that it is not the availability of the past which gives rise to the discipline of history, but rather that the discipline constitutes or produces the past as an object 
constituted such that it is available for investigation and representation through this code. I have further specified some of the important elements of this code. If these arguments are sound, then we are in a position to ask what the code of history is for, what it does in societies where it is dominant, what forms of public life it is connected to and facilitates, and what forms of subjectivity it helps to produce and sustain. Note that this question really only forces itself upon us once we see history as a code, as a mode of relating to the past. The moment we see it as the right mode, it's evidence-based, it's rational, unlike, you know, Miss Epic Legend, then, of course, we don't normally ask what is it for, because, again, truth is its own reward. It's there because it's right, whereas the other ways are wrong. We do ask, what function does myth perform in a society? We don't, or at least we are less likely to ask, what, what, what function does history perform, history writing? But this question forces itself on our consciousness the moment we see history as a mode, a, a mode and a code of constituting the past. An obvious place to start our inquiry into what does it do would be to ask what, it could, what could it possibly be for, given that, as I have argued, one of the constituent presumptions of the code of history is that the past is dead. Why, we could join Nietzsche in asking, would one bother to represent a past that is dead, that has no instruction and entertainment to offer us? The answer, I speculatively suggest, is that like the other forms of historicity that it is an alternative to and which it threatens to supersede, historiography also establishes continuities with the past. But it does so not by treating the past as available, as present, as that which can be resurrected, but precisely by the opposite means, by insisting that the past is dead and then establishing different kinds of continuities. I'm suggesting that the code of history introduces division and rupture in order to then bridge the gap between then and now and between identity and difference. How so? Very briefly. If the first element of the code of history is that the past is dead and can only be represented, not resurrected, the other two elements of the code I've just been drawing attention to, the humanist or anthropological element and the determinist element, bridge the gap between the dead past and the living present. The humanist presumption establishes the existence of the object of the historical enterprise, man or humanity, as a meaning-producing and value-creating being. The effect is to establish both identity, humanity is a stable object that makes it possible to write its history, and a difference. However, this humanity is changing all the time, and the task of history is to recreate those changes and to, sometimes to explain them. The past is dead and thus utterly different, which means that the voices that it has left, documents, monuments, etc., have to be interpreted and translated into our terms. But the very fact that meaning but the very fact that the records through which we reconstitute the past are produced by meaning producing beings just like us means that their meanings are recuperable, means that translation is possible, and means that we represent those who, like us, produced meaning and purpose but produced different meanings and different purposes. The determinist element of the code also affects an operation that establishes identity and difference. The past is dead and cannot be resurrected, only represented. And yet, we are still connected to the past through all the ways in which it, is, it has shaped or determined the present. Here, causality establishes continuity. Our now is very different from there then, but our now is in some sense a product of there then, and the role of the determinist element of the code of history is to locate and identify those social, economic, and other changes and ruptures which mark a threshold of difference and a division, and yet in the very way, manner of doing so, establish a causal or genetic connection and continuity. These two elements of the code, as I observed earlier, certainly do not logically imply each other, Indeed, they're often in tension with each other. But when brought together to work in tandem, as they are when the code of history is employed to constitute and represent the past, they establish sameness and otherness, identity and difference. And thus, history performs the same role as the traditions of historicizing it as replaced, that of establishing, establishing continuity with the past. 
So, I've been suggesting the code of history performs the same function as tradition, that of establishing continuity with the past. But I want to conclude the final section of my paper by suggesting that it cannot perform this function fully when it comes to non-Western past, because here the code is at odds with the past that it represents. Let me flesh out what I mean. In the discipline of history, anachronism is counted as one of the gravest sins. And yet, history is caught up in anachronism whenever it is applied to pass where such presumptions, where its own presumptions were not widely shared. Where, for instance, the secular premises of the code were not shared by those whom the code is applied to. For instance, we assume that, as I said, that gods to be ex are to be explained in terms of men, not men in terms of gods. But this is a problem for the code of history. Michel de Certeau sums up the problem nicely, and I quote, historians spontaneously take their task to be the need to determine what a field delineated as religious can teach them about a society. Society is the axis of reference. In this perspective, comprehending religious phenomena is tantamount to repeatedly asking something else of them than what they meant to say, taking as a representation of society what, from their point of view, founded that society. So we confront the religious figure for whom God explains society, not society explains God, but the modern code of history makes us invert that and say we, we might take their beliefs seriously and treat them with respect, but what we do is explain why they believe the things that they did. We can't actually take those beliefs seriously in writing our history. Certeau characterizes this through a metaphor drawn from chess. Between their time and ours, the signifier and the signified have castles. We postulate a coding which inverts that of the time we are studying. What Certeau calls castling, and what I am calling anachronism, applying to the past categories of understanding that do not belong to that past, should be deeply troubling for history writing. And yet, it seldom troubles historians. The reflective questions asked by a Certeau are, relatively speaking, rare. Why? The answer is at once simple and not so. It's simple in as much as part of the answer is that we grant, simply grant our categories epistemic privilege. Here we're back to the story of modern knowledge. Modern knowledge is truer than everything it has replaced. We, creatures of the modern, were finally in the privileged position where we could see what eluded our ancestors. Therefore, we are perfectly entitled when differing, studying different human subjects to bracket their self-understandings and describe what was really happening there, including, and this is the ultimate trick, we outflank them and we explain not only why they thought, not, not only, we not only ignore or bracket what they thought, we explain why they thought what they thought. So if they're religious, this is alienation, or it's a representation of the social unity in the form of the god or the totem or whatever. So that's one reason. But if we remember that part of what history does is both to recognize the otherness of the past and establish continuities of it with it, what I'm calling anachronism is not only overlooked, but also in a sense redeemed. To continue with the example of Certeau and his own example of 17th century France, the subject of the historian study may treat the Christian act, God as an actor in the world. The historian cannot and privileges um, his, her modern so secular categories um, in explanation. She may, in the fashion described earlier or elsewhere, do so on the presumption that these modern categories are superior, that they're right. But nonetheless, this anachronism is still rendered intelligible by the fact that this world in which God created man gave way to the one in which we now think God was man's creation. That the world of 17th century France yielded to our world. In Certeau's words again, founded on the rupture between a past that is its object and a present that is the place of its practice, history endlessly finds the present in its object and the past in its practice. That is, the premise of historical, including intellectual continuity, means that we are, in a sense, the heirs of those whom we study. The past that we re represent, even if we do so anachronistically, is the past that produced our present. So there is always a bridge connecting us to them, assuring us that we are born of them, and thus that there is a connection which redeems our anachronisms. But, and I come to the end of my paper, 
The same is not true in India. For the code of history, and not only India, but I take India as my example, for the code of history did not emerge out of an engagement with indigenous forms of historicity. Its victory was instead cheaply won by administrative fiat, as India's new rulers dismissed existing traditions of historicity and began writing history in the modern mode. As I observed at the beginning of this paper, by the latter 19th century, the history taught in schools and universities produced by the colonial bureaucracy and also the contestatory histories that began to be written by nationalists were all of the European modern type. And this was so not because this code had engaged and emerged out of the traditions it displaced, but purely because of external imposition. And as a result, the categories of analysis not only didn't correspond to the world that they describe, a problem that also conf confronts, say, the French historian of 17th century France, the Soto example, but they also didn't derive from this world. They were not part of any Indian past, but were rather wholly external to it. Thus, in India, historiography is caught up in an anachronism. Its central categories are not those of whom it writes without this being redeemed. That is, without this anachronism being a productive one that illuminates the tradition to which we belong because we have become separated from that tradition by a deep scissoring. In summary, the code of history is not adequate to non-Western pasts. Its epistemic legitimation can only be the objectivist one. Our, our, our presumptions are right. The presumptions of our subjects are wrong. It cannot be supplemented by the hermeneutic one, which says not this is the right way to represent the past, but rather that this is the past out of which we derive our current way of studying that past, and therefore there are all sorts of continuities which redeem whatever anachronism may be at work in our practice. And this, in India and elsewhere, is not only an intellectual problem, but a practical, political, and ethical one. Because while in the West historiography, even though it's still only one form of historicity, is nonetheless arguably the dominant one and plays a regulative role vis-a-vis -vis others, that is far from being so in India and in many other parts of the world. Indeed, historiography is the dominant form at most amongst urban elite levels. Elsewhere, other forms of historicity compete with it. And where historiography cannot perform its hermeneutic function of recapitulating a tradition, but has only its objectivist justification, then the Indian historian gets positioned as he or she who hectors her people, scolding them for failing to emancipate themselves from superstition and unreason. Every time there is a public controversy in India over the past, this script is reenacted. But if, yeah, but if, as I have suggested, history is not the right way of representing the past finally discovered, but one code amongst others, then we should be extremely wary of being positioned as the impatient pedagogues of our pupils or pupils. What we should do instead, I suggest, is to think that this code becomes more congruent with its object the closer we get to the present, when the other elements of modern knowledge that history draws upon and is part of become real structuring elements of life in India. When subjects emerge, when subjectivity is sharply differentiated from object, when the categories of mind and consciousness become meaningful for larger groups of people, and so on. I suggest, in short, that historiography is most at home as is happening with the histories of art, music, and science, when it recapitulates the conditions of its own possibility and emergence. Thank you. OK, thank you a lot. Um, <clears throat> we're running behind time. Uh, we have some time for uh, discussion, but I have some terrible news. There's no break. The break will be cancelled and we're going on to the parallel sessions. Now, as a collective actor, we did this to ourselves uh, since we went, came in so slowly that we, of course, had to give the uh, uh, keynote speaker his full uh, time. So, I'll gather some questions uh, and then I'll uh, chase you out to the parallel sessions. Yes, I see Alan. <clears throat> uh, press twice. Now press long and then press twice. <clears throat>
Yes, okay, come on. Surely, Indian history does derive from the Indian past, which includes India's encounter with Western imperialism. And my question is, what is your response? But now a second question. Is your objection to the code, or is it not perhaps rather to the way history is perhaps still being written in India? Okay, I'll see whether there's another question. Uh, I'll gather questions, but no. Let's uh, give time for a response. All right. Um, thank you very much, Professor McGill, for those questions. Um, yes, Indian history writing is connected with the Indian past, but the conclusion of my slightly rushed paper was that it becomes adequate to its subject matter roughly from that moment onwards. The paradox arises, and even then only partially, the paradox arises, for instance, when we write the past of, say, ancient India, or what I'm using categories of periodization, which are problematic, but let's run with them for now. So, yes, I take your point, but in a way that is part of my argument, that it's when, and it's an argument I've made in much greater detail elsewhere, it's when notions like mind, consciousness, um, the idea that gods and spirits are ultimately to be located in what is going on in our heads. It's when they gain some social purchase that the gap between the presumptions of the code and that which it is studying begins to at least narrow. Prior to a certain time, that gap is very, very wide and deep. And my objection to, is not to, in fact, I don't object to the code at all. I'm, I, I consider myself more as an agnostic who doesn't say this is a bad code but who begins by saying, this is a code amongst others, and therefore we are entitled and indeed should ask, what does it do, what is it connected to, what things does it facilitate, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, It enables and is connected to many things, which I personally, for whatever little it's worth, approve of. You know, you, you, in the modern world, you know, narratives of social justice, of egalitarianism, often need the presumptions embedded in the code of history. So I'm not against it at all. I simply want to, as it were, point out that it's one code amongst many. And that's something of more than purely intellectual interest for as long as other codes, as I am describing them, continue to exist. Because as long as they continue to exist, we need to see this as a code and not as the right way of representing the past finally discovered, because otherwise it puts us, positions us in such a way that we can only regard with condescension other ways of representing to the past. And that brings me to the second element of your question. I, I don't also have any objection to the way in which history has been written in India. I mean, depends on who did the writing, but. I mean, many of my friends and colleagues are, you know, very fine historians of India, and I have no problem with that. My, my problem here is the code, and again, it gets back to that gap. And very briefly, I mean, I probably began to think of these questions long ago, and it was after the tearing down of Babri Masjid in India, an event which, this was the tearing down of a mosque which the Hindu far right suddenly started claiming had been the site of Ram's, the Lord God Ram's birthplace, and uh, they claimed that the Muslims uh, in medieval times had torn that down, put up a mosque, and a crazed mob of fanatics egged on by the BJP and the RSS tore down this mosque. And it was, it was an event that rent the nation because in a way it tore apart the script that said that it didn't matter what, whether you were a Hindu or Muslim or whatever, um, to be an Indian. This was a way of declaring actually you had to be a Hindu or at least formally subscribe to being a Hindu to be an Indian. Now, the story peddled by the BJP and others was historically speaking nonsense. There was not an iota of evidentiary proof. Yet what is so striking is historian after historian wrote, lectured, publicized that this was nonsense. And you know, it made very little difference. Um, there were modes of historicizing, not traditional, untouched by the past. One of the interesting things is that what the BJP was producing was pamphlets which combined, they appealed to the modern code of history and to, to those things that it makes possible. They often had precise dates. The Lord Ram was born in 
you know, 1 billion BC or whatever. The so they use the precision of modern, the code of modern history along with elements that are completely external to it. And I think many people seeing the failure, uncomfortable on the one hand at having to be pedagogues to their people, and on the other hand seeing the, you know, if we're going to wait for that gap to close, we'll be waiting a long bloody time. And at that point, I think many people started asking, not is this a bad code, but rather we need to pay more attention to other modes of historicity. We need not to dismiss them as mistaken or treat them as raw materials for our own historical narratives, but start to understand them better because they're often, not in their untouched, pristine forms, but they're often still alive and they matter politically, ethically, intellectually. So, that's where this is coming from, not with a desire to, you know, say the code is bad, and nor with, you know, certainly not with a desire to, you know, uh, 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 run down the work of, you know, friends and colleagues who write on Indian history for whom I have unlimited respect. Um. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, let's uh, give him a warm applause. And then... Uh...